After many weeks, the Ukrainian offensive has ended in failure. The Russians also failed to make significant territorial advances during this time. But there are many indications that time will play in Russia's favor. What is the most likely scenario for developments in the coming months? Is Russia preparing another offensive? And can Ukraine still prevail? OSW analyst Andrzej Wilk explains. The coming weeks are unlikely to bring a significant change on the battlefield. The current winter season is not very favorable for developing any wide-scale activities and, at least in the coming weeks, until the beginning of next year or even until the end of January, we should not expect a change in these stable weather conditions that would significantly affect the possibility of one side or the other speeding up their activities on the battleground. However, it is highly probable that this relative stabilization might prove to be a kind of small but downward spiral for the Ukrainian army, which is once again on the defensive in most directions. The Russian army is nonetheless advancing, even though it is not carrying out any actions that we would perceive as significant, i.e. offensives with troop movements of a few, a dozen or a few dozen kilometers a day. The Russian army is advancing in the northeast and east of Kupiansk Kharkiv region, to the northwest and southwest of Bakhmut. The Russians already have their pincer movement around Avdiivka and almost in Marienka. They're advancing. The situation in the south is a little more stable for the defenders. In the Zaporizhia region and in the Kherson region, Ukrainians are still attempting to carry out some offensive actions, but these are largely symbolic. For months they have been trying to carry out an offensive that would help them cut off Russia's land connection to Crimea, namely on the border of the Zaporizhia and Donetsk regions, south of Velika Novosilka, or by a slightly shorter route south of Orekhov and in the Zaporizhia region, the actions of the Ukraine Ukrainian army have also been symbolic. Nevertheless, in recent weeks we could still see some offensive actions on the part of Ukraine, on the Russian-occupied left bank of the Dnipro, in the Kherson region, which Ukrainians are trying to maintain, although with modest forces, creating bridgeheads, maintaining them, and showing that they are indeed active. To sum up, Ukraine has gone on the defensive on a large section of the front, and it's a defensive that is slowly buckling under Russian pressure. Russian military potential is steadily increasing, but this does not necessarily mean a new great offensive by Russian troops. Russians are trying to learn from their mistakes and remember what happened in March 2022 when they wanted to break through Ukrainian defensive lines with clearly insufficient forces at a time when Ukrainian defenses of the large cities of Kyiv, Chernihiv and Kharkiv had stabilized. The current approach of the Russians indicates that they know they suffered losses disproportionate to the gains. The losses which could not be made up for by industrial power have now largely been made up for. Right Right now this army is much stronger, much bigger, more powerful than it was in February 2022. But this is at the cost of draining reserves. It's stockpiles of armaments drawn from warehouse depots rather than production to make up for those losses. One fears that if another strike on a larger scale may be launched somewhere, it will not be dictated by growing Russian capabilities, but by a sense, a conviction on the part of the Russians, that in a given direction they can, as they say, go go in like a hot knife through butter, meeting the least resistance. Russian forces would have to be convinced that this time they have a sufficient advantage. There are again signs of the possibility of the Russians returning to strike from the direction of Belarus, but so far these claims are based on inferences rather than on the visible movement of Russian forces. A possible strike towards Kyiv has already lost all meaning because the Russians, colloquially speaking, overshot their mark at the start of the invasion when they believed that within a few days this seizure of Kyiv would result in them overthrowing the legitimate Ukrainian authorities, controlling the capital and dictating terms for the whole of Ukraine and a Ukraine that would surrender at once. Obviously, this policy was an utter failure, and it is difficult to expect that it has changed enough by now that another strike on Kyiv would result in success, especially as the Ukrainians in the north have also expanded their defenses and created defensive lines and minefields, the kind that they themselves encountered in the Zaporizhia and Donetsk regions, trying to break 
break through to the Sea of Azov, and they were unable to cross them, these Russian defense lines. The Russians would be facing a similar situation right now, attacking from the Belarusian side. Something that would still make sense from a military point of view, of course with the different assessments of the situation by the Russians and what would have made sense in February 2022, is a strike along Poland's eastern border. Success here would cut Ukraine off from military support. We should bear in mind that practically from the beginning of the war, NATO's eastern flank is this direct rear area, this first rear area that is not bombed, attacked with missiles or drones, a place of safety. Poland, to a lesser extent Slovakia, Romania through Poland, partly also Lithuania, they constitute this Ukrainian operational depth, and being cut off from this operational depth, one might claim, cuts Ukrainians off from everything. Without it, they are left with only the will and motivation to fight. However, there is no need for the Russians to decide on another offensive at all. Time is currently playing in their favor. Everything depends on how the international situation develops for Russia, how they will be able to achieve the other objectives of the operation against Ukraine, which they continue to maintain. These concern demilitarization, understood to mean that Ukraine does not aspire to NATO membership. Its army would be practically non-existent, or denazification, in the sense that there is no government in Ukraine attempting to integrate into Western structures. If Ukraine steps back, and if the West steps back, it can be assumed that the Russians will accept with all their blessings that they can end the war. It may be agreed that these four regions will become part of the Russian Federation, with more or less official acceptance of the West, while Ukraine in the years to come would be subject to a sort of so-called Belarusization, some sort of progressive incorporation or dependence on Russia. Currently, however, it's difficult to expect such a scenario for several reasons. Focusing on the front lines, the most likely scenario is that of a relatively stable but nevertheless downward spiral for the Ukrainians. A less likely scenario is some perhaps limited offensive on the Russian side, but only if the Russians feel that this would bring them additional success without some major losses, which they are so far unlikely to be ready for. Ukraine can still turn around this downward spiral, but only with the support of the West. The Ukrainians may carry out a counter-offensive in a few months or so, which would bring them operational success, help them regain some more of the territory currently occupied by the Russians. Perhaps not all of it, perhaps not Crimea, but militarily, Ukraine, in cooperation with the West, broadly speaking, can achieve this. The moment the military support from the West is broken, halted, or some maximum depletion, then the end of the war, unfavorable for the Ukrainians, is a matter of time. Perhaps a matter of months, perhaps a matter of weeks. But without Western support, it's a matter of time. However, there is also the Ukrainian element, which I have already mentioned. And here we can see, especially this year, last year this was different, that there is a certain reversal of vectors. The Ukrainians are less and less willing to fight. Well, certainly not all of them. There are some who will fight there, without enough food or equipment, but they will fight to the death. And although there are many such soldiers, there is a growing number of Ukrainians who would like to withdraw from the war. And this number is growing in line with Kyiv's demand for new recruits. Within the European Union alone, there are officially 650,000 Ukrainians of mobilization age. For several months now, Kyiv has been carrying out campaigns in the West, traveling to Poland, among other places, trying to make these Ukrainians staying in Poland or other European countries return home to full fulfill their duty. But instead we have information about more escape attempts in Ukraine, with official numbers saying that more than 20,000 Ukrainians have illegally crossed the border and about 20,000 have been caught in the attempt. So the scale is quite large. Now let's juxtapose this with what's happening in Russia. We remember how they introduced this so-called partial mobilization in Russia in November 2022. As the government was deciding on the mobilization, there was a rapid wave of mass departures. Russians estimated, depending on the data, that between 250,000 and 400,000 men of mobilization age left Russia, mainly for the South Caucasus and Central Asia. We also have to remember 
remember that a great many people from these former Soviet republics lived and worked in Russia and had Russian passports, but they simply did not want to die for this Russia, especially as this mobilization was carried out just after the successful Ukrainian offensive near Kharkiv. On the other hand, the mobilization somehow succeeded for the Russians. Those Russians who were on the front line hardened up and the situation also began to change. Russia can still afford to pay the average soldier who goes to the front as a contract soldier $2,000 a month. That's a very decent salary in some NATO eastern flank countries, let alone for someone from Kubinka, somewhere in Siberia, or even the northeast of Moscow. We can imagine someone thinking, well, my brother-in-law died and my neighbor's brother also died, but a few others came back, served their time, they're rich, and they even brought back a fridge, a washing machine and a few other things there, so why not me? And, unfortunately, there are still plenty willing to serve with this mindset in Russia. The support of the West in this case is not just of military significance. It also improves the morale of the fighting Ukrainians and mobilizes them to continue the fight. It also symbolically contradicts Russian propaganda, which is trying to convince Ukraine of the West's betrayal. Thank you for watching. If you haven't yet, make sure to like and subscribe to watch all our coverage from the region.